have to admit that uh, last night when uh, I Trent when I asked about Galatians four that uh, as we went through that um, uh, self got taken down a notch. Uh, praise praise the heavenly family. <laughs> um, I was a little cautious easing into that subject because I wasn't sure what information might be in the golden bowl about it. And uh, right. and uh, when I finally specifically pointed to the part in Galatians 4 that I was in, talking about, then you came back with with the connections that that I needed to, to know about that I was not aware of previously. And so uh, I thank you too, and I thank the Heavenly Family for you. Very well, much all, so. praise, all praise to our Heavenly Family. And, Amen. And I am also grateful for your testimony in that regard um, because that, it deals with the principle that it's important for us to mention. And I'll, I'll mention it first before we transition over to the Silver Trumpet article to kind of talk about what this whole thing is about. What is this message about? What are these meetings about? And how we're approaching this whole thing. And the fact of the matter is, Heavenly Family, I just want to ask for guidance to convey these things very, very clearly and as it is in truth. So the fact of the matter is that this message and everything that we experience in this message is a purification and it is a test. And everyone who has come in contact with this message has been put to the test by the various truths which have been brought forward by our Heavenly Family. And what this message does is that it cuts at our idols. And everyone comes to this message inevitably with their private interpretations and their false theories that they have gained from uninspired teachings. And what this message does is by simply proclaiming the truth as it is, rebukes those private interpretations. And we are all put to the test to see, will we give up those things in favor of pure truth? And what we're going to be going through in this new moon study in particular, to be honest, I don't know if there is one person who could read this and not have their idols um, struck. And what that means is that it brings people to a point of decision. Either they will hold on to their idols and be struck with them and thus fall away from the truth, or they will release their idols and let them be utterly destroyed and themselves freed, which is a, a painful experience to some extent. And so that's what we're going to be going through in this new moon. And could, I say, could I say one more little thing and then I'll, I'll be quiet? Um, oh, I uh, listened, I finished listening to um, Feelings or Choice today. And I just want to share with everybody listening that if you haven't listened to that, you need to. And uh, I'll finish by saying that um, I said the prayer contained in that study with you on the tape and uh, just waiting to see what heaven does from here out. Thank you. Amen. 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 And... Thank you so much for sharing that too, Mike. So this this thing with the silver trumpet, I'm going to go through 
I just wanted to mention that the seriousness of what this message is about calls for the deepest self-examination. It calls for the affliction of soul that the Day of Atonement is really about. Um, so before we actually get into the study, I would like us to take a 10-minute break and for everyone to enter into your private closet, so to speak, and talk to our Heavenly Family for 10 minutes and enter into self-examination and ask our Heavenly Family to put it within you to be willing to receive whatever truth they may have and to be willing to cast aside all preconceived ideas regardless of how much you may cherish them as we go through this study. Do you want to do that? Yep. Yeah. Amen. All right, well, let's break then now for 10 minutes. So we'll be back at 9 o'clock. At the top of the hour, wherever you are. Yeah, top of the hour, wherever you are. That's All right, so... I'll just mention again that it is um, March 21st now, Saturday night, and we're just entering into the new moon of the first month. And um, we've already been studying for a bit, reading in Ellen White's testimony on the philosophy of vain deceit. And... um, In those testimonies, she was speaking of spiritualism, and we have gone through to uh, kind of recap the overall idea of immaterialism and materialism. So we're not going to do that again here in this study, but we're going to be getting into the article of the Silver Trumpet called The Detrimental Effects of Immaterialism upon reasonable thinking. And just a few things that I want to mention before we get into um, the actual subject and before we pray is the solemnity and reverence with which we should come to the study of Scripture. And when we're hearing this message... Um, especially on a new moon, it's very important that we listen carefully and that we are having the spirit of self-examination about us and allowing the truth to do the work that it's intended to do in cutting away our idol. And um, as we do this, going through... Uh, these new moon studies, I'll I'll briefly mention some of the idea of what a new moon is. Um, And we have other studies that address this more thoroughly than I'm about to, which I'll uh, reference to you. First, I'll I'll mention a study that Doug wrote called She is a Tree of Life, and then also the Silver Trumpet Volume 1, Number 1. And basically, the new moons are times of eating fresh fruit from the tree of life. And in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 18, it says of wisdom, she is a tree of life. Proverbs chapter 7, verse 4 says, Say unto wisdom, thou art my sister. Proverbs chapter 8, wisdom herself tells us that she was born before the foundation of the world. Wisdom is the begotten daughter, the spirit who gives life, um, the other comforter who was sent to guide us into all truth, of whom we are to be born in the experience that we call born again, which is justification by faith, being, being freed from sin. And what it means to eat the fresh fruit from the tree of life 
each new moon, each month, is the same thing that Christ meant when he said, eat my flesh and drink my blood. And people were confused. And he said, the spirit is the one who gives life. The the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. When he said, I am the vine and ye are the branches, he said, let my word abide in you. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. It's life-giving truth, reality as it is, that our Heavenly Family is offering up to us. And we're going to be looking at what that is. So as we go through this, in, in lots of our studies that we've been going through, such as the testimonies, reading through the testimonies, it's very much uh, a lot of discussion, and we'll read a paragraph and stop and go through discussion in that regard. And that's kind of different from how we've been doing things for the studies in which we go through the silver trumpet. Um, In order to really get the fullness of what it is saying and to hear it in its context and its true impact, it kind of needs to just be read through. And so that's what we're going to do. I'm going to read it through, and then afterward uh, we can discuss its contents. And I won't be able to read the whole of the first article tonight, um, but we will be continuing tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, So everyone is definitely (laughs) invited to come and be a part of that. But uh, so I wanted to mention, uh, for those of you who are new to the calls, uh, if you want to put your phone on mute when you're not speaking, uh, you can do that by hitting star six. And then to unmute, you can also do that to hit star six again. Um, but in order to really just go through this, I want to ask that you all listen very carefully as we go through the article, and then at the end, um, we'll discuss it. But let's ask our Heavenly Family for guidance now before we actually get into it. Heavenly Family, thank you. Thank you for your love and thank you for the revelation of yourselves. I know that there is an incredible work that you are here doing, Heavenly Family. It's a work that you've been intending to do for a long time and you've been attempting to do with unwilling humanity for a long time. But you've told us in your word that your people will be willing in the day of your power And Heavenly Family, I certainly want to play my part in encouraging a willing spirit amongst all those who are willing to be made willing. And so, Heavenly Family, on that note, I want to ask you personally for guidance. I want to ask that you help me to convey these solemn truths that you have given us and to do so in such a way that your love is seen in its true prominence. Heavenly Family, I ask that you guide us and that you fight for each one here and that you impress upon each person the solemnity of the truth and and the reality of the experience to which you are calling them. Heavenly Family, Save each one from temptation. Please save them. Restore reason and truth to their minds. And please make me able to play my part in, in, uh, in doing so. Help us, Heavenly Family. We are in desperate need of everything that you have to offer us. We are weak as you yourself were weak, dear brother. But we know that when you were weak, you were made strong. But you were only made strong by complete dependence and by the power of the truth. 
So likewise, Heavenly Family, give us that complete dependence on you and help us to see the truth for what it is and to experience the mind-changing and thought-changing efficacy of the truth. Help us to gain an experimental knowledge of you. Father and Mother, I ask these things knowing that it is your will and knowing that you will do everything possible to bring these things about. So I thank you for that. And I thank you in the name of your two wonderful children that you have sent to accomplish this great work of salvation. In the name of Branch, he and she. Amen. 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 Now, some of the things that we're going to reference and that are referenced within this issue of the Silver Trumpet hearken back to previous issues and other things within this message that if you haven't read everything and um, haven't uh, been to all of our studies, you may be less familiar with. But I, I know that it is, the truth is simple enough that you will doubtless understand what is being spoken of. And we all have so, so far to go in comprehending the truth in its fullness anyway. So we're really all in the same boat together. So this article anyways, it's called The Detrimental Effects of Immaterialism Upon Reasonable Thinking. Now, just by the title, you can get a fairly good idea as to what this is about. Immaterialism, again, is the belief in the existence of the non-physical. What does that belief do to the way we think? How does it affect reasonable thinking? And in what way is it detrimental? So, I'll start reading the article here. In discipline and repetition, we have an opportunity for our minds to grasp a hold of the truth. So, we ask the question, what has been the focus of this message for the past six months. Would someone like to briefly answer that? For the past six months, what has been the focus of this message? Someone who knows. Justification by faith. Amen. Justification by faith. And what has been the call? The call to enter into season. Carol? The call to the priesthood and, and the consecration of the priesthood. Amen. The call to enter into priesthood and to rebuild the temple. That has been the focus for the past six months. That has been what every revelation in the Silver Trumpets has been about. And that's the focus. Yes, you have been called to be builders and priests. Think on this. Contemplate this truth. Have you responded? Have you responded as did those newly returned exiles in the days of Haggai? Think on this. What say you? Do your actions testify to your belief? Or is there an idea in your mind which has caused you to view reality as a fiction and fiction as reality? Again, you have been called into priesthood. You have been called to build a spiritual temple. Is this fact or fiction? 
How do you view these things? What is it which could cause you to see but not perceive and hear but not know that it is so? As you know, our Heavenly Family has been attempting to build their spiritual house, 1 Peter 2, verse 5, for some time. This work of building their temple, or their people rather, as a temple on earth, is intimately connected with the work of the grand anti-typical sanctuary in heaven, as can be seen by reading Daniel chapter 8. The enemy of souls has destroyed the truth of the heavenly tabernacle in the minds of the professed followers of Christ. Thus disconnected from Christ, Satan was able to cause blindness to grow and sin to flourish in the church. As these sins increased and were recorded in the books of heaven, the sanctuary became more and more polluted and Christ has had to continue his anxiety-stricken intercession, crying, My blood, Father, my blood, my blood, my blood. Early Writings, page 38. In this way, the devil has been able to touch even heaven itself and the very gods whom he used to serve. You see, it's by our sin that Christ is caused to continue. Because when the sanctuary is cleansed, when this is complete, when there are no longer the records of God's professed people being taken to heaven to be there recorded in in the books of record, then Christ can finally end his intercession. But until then, he's crying, My blood, Father, my blood, my blood, my blood. Our heavenly family, though, had another plan. They sent their angel, Revelation 10, to commence the work of the restoration of all things. As they, particularly our father, mother, and brother, in the sanctuary above, began to cleanse the temple. So this angel that they sent, Revelation 10, who we know as a symbol of, is a symbol of the presence of God, the other comforter. She came to restore. And what did she come to restore? We know that she came to restore the truth, right? That's what's revealed in Daniel chapter 8. The Shepherd's Rod, volume 2, page 130 to 133, goes through this. Uh, So I recommend everyone read that. Was it not the sanctuary truth? As the sanctuary was seen, was there not also seen the ark containing the Ten Commandments? Early writings, page 42. As these truths were being restored, did not our Heavenly Family also restore the truth of the personhood of the Father and the Son? Early Writings, page 54. All these truths are the foundation of our faith as Seventh-day Adventists. These are the truths which have made us who we are as a people. Again, the Sabbath, the sanctuary, the personhood of the Father and the Son. Those truths, the truths of materialism, are the truths that made us what we are as a Seventh-day Adventist people. By the 1880s, there were many who were newly coming into the faith of the Third Angel's message. Those who came in at that time did not have the experience of the disappointment and of the years which followed in the settling of the vital points of truth connected with the message, nor did they see the manifestation of the Holy Spirit through Ellen White in confirming these truths. 
the condition of things had become a wilderness of theory, and the truth was taken for granted. Pride and striving for supremacy were gaining ground among those who would be leaders of the church, and the unique truths were no longer being taught as they once were. The church turned back from following Christ her leader and steadily retreated toward worldliness. Testimonies 5, page 217, which of course there it says, steadily retreating towards Egypt, which is worldliness. Our Heavenly Family then sent a message which was to wake the sleeping people, to moisten the dry bones, and to bring life to those dead in trespasses and sins. This message of righteousness by faith brought in 1888 was pitifully ridiculed, despised, and rejected. This true story becomes sadder still when we follow the history of those through whom the message came. Jones and Wagner, along with Kellogg, who had also been sent of heaven to accomplish a great work, that of the medical missionary work, went astray from the faith. Later, others, such as A.F. Ballinger, departed from the faith, accepting falsehood in place of truth. This same folly has been practiced from ancient times, and it has been repeated and repeated, and it will be repeated yet. Quoting now, this is Manuscript 760, page 4, 1905, from Ellen White. Let us all cling to the established truth of the sanctuary, those who are so short-sighted that they will begin to do the work that some others have been doing in advocating the sentiments contained in Living Temple, which is Kellogg's book, are departing from the living God in spiritualistic, satanic experiences that will not do the souls who receive them any good. They are departing from the faith seeking to tear down the foundation of truth. The men who have lost their hold on the truths of the sanctuary question, as they have been presented by men who have been under the Holy Spirit's guidance, had better pray more and talk less. I testify in the name of the Lord that Elder Ballinger is led by satanic agencies and spiritualistic invisible leaders. Those who have the guidance of the Holy Spirit will turn away from these seducing sentiments. Next statement is from the same manuscript, manuscript 760, page 14, 1905 by Ellen White. The Lord would have us at this time bring in the testimony written by those who are now dead to speak in behalf of heavenly things. The Holy Spirit has been instructing us in these last days. We are to repeat the testimonies that God has given his people, the testimonies that present clear conceptions of the truths of the sanctuary and that show the relation of Christ to the truths of the sanctuary so clearly brought to view. If we are the Lord's appointed messengers, we shall not spring up with new ideas and theories to contradict the message that God has given through his servants since 1844. At that time, many sought the Lord with heart and soul and voice. The men whom God raised up were diligent searchers of the scriptures, and those who today claim to have light and to contradict the teaching of God's ordained messengers who were working under the Holy Spirit's guidance, those who get up new theories which remove the pillars of our faith, are not doing the will of God, but are bringing in fallacies of their own invention, which, if received, will cut the church away from the anchorage of truth and set them adrift, or set them drifting, rather, drifting, 
to where they will receive any sophistries that may arise. These will be similar to that which Dr. J. H. Kellogg, under Satan's special guidance, has been working for years. End of the quote. The attacks of the devil in shutting out the light of justification by faith, as brought in 1888, and in carrying away the messengers who bore that message, consisted in the subtle deceptions of spiritualistic sophistry. Emphasis, spiritualistic sophistry. In this message, we have learned that spiritualism is much more than communicating with demons fronting as dead relatives. We have learned that spiritualism is simply the belief in the immaterial, or to put it another way, the idea that there is a non-physical reality. A guy named Thomas McElwain, who wrote a book called Adventism and Ellen White, A Phenomenon of Religious Materialism, summarizes the early Adventist use of the term spiritualism in this way. Quoting, the term spiritualism or spiritualizing theology is used in relation to materialism or materialist theology as any system of theology that appeals to the existence of the immaterial, denying the basic premises of materialism. So again, immaterialism the belief in the existence of the non-physical materialism, the belief in the soul existence of the material. This is what the early Adventists believed, and there will be two articles that we include from early Adventist pioneers that will be included in this issue of the Silver Trumpet, one called Materialism by B.F. Robbins, and another called Immateriality by James White. A review of early Adventist literature bears this out, as can be seen from reading the writings of the pioneers themselves. Now consider the following. This is two more statements from Ellen White. The first is Manuscript 760, again, page 9, 1905. And this is what it says. Those who seek to remove the old landmarks are not holding fast. They are not remembering how they have received and heard. Those who try to bring in theories that would remove the pillars of our faith concerning the sanctuary or concerning the personality of God or of Christ are working as blind men. They are seeking to bring in uncertainties and to set the people of God adrift without an anchor. The next is a short statement from Ellen White in a letter to Kellogg, letter 300, 1903. You, this is again her speaking to Kellogg, who is bringing in pantheistic theories that viewed God in such a way as to make him, at least in part, immaterial. She says, You are not definitely clear on the personality of God, which is everything to us as a people. You have virtually destroyed the Lord God himself. Here the truth is clearly defined. The belief in spiritualistic ideas, the belief in immateriality, virtually destroys God himself. This will be seen to be true when considering what immateriality really is. The truth, though, is that immateriality cannot really itself be defined. It can only be defined as to what it is not. The immaterial is, quote-unquote, not material. It is the absence of anything and everything that we can possibly name or conceive of. There is no distinguishing between the immaterial and the non-existent, 
other than that some say that the immaterial is real, but none would dare say the same thing concerning the non-existent. And James White, in his article on immateriality, says practically the same thing. In fact, he goes so far to say that no man, nor angel, nor even God himself, can even conceive of the idea of immateriality. So, how do we know what is real and what is not? What is the difference between imagining a thing and a thing really existing? Is it not that the thing has actual physical substance to it? Is not that the difference? Those of you who have been studying the message for some time have probably heard the question asked, why is such and such a thing true? For instance, if I say, you are reading these words right now, or you are listening to these words right now, is it true? Well, all here would say yes. Well, why is it true? Is it not because it is actually what is happening in the material world? Versus if you were to just imagine reading this article, or if you were to imagine listening to this article, or these words. That would not make it real. Materialism, then, is how we know the difference between what is real, what is true, and what is not. In fact, without materialism, there is no way of knowing what is true and what is not. Most Christians are what is called substance dualists, which means that they believe the universe to be made up of two substances, quote-unquote substances, the material and the immaterial. God, angels, heaven, hell, souls, spirits, etc., are said to be the immaterial, while everything that we experience with the natural senses is said to be the material. God himself is conceived of as being a great mind which is present in all places since he is, quote-unquote, not limited to space or time. What does this mean in terms of discerning between what is real and what is not? With this thinking, what is real cannot be determined based off, off of whether it exists in the material world or not. Again, with this thinking, the thinking that the world and the universe is made up of two fundamental substances, the material and the immaterial, with this thinking, what is real or what is true cannot be determined based off of whether it exists in the immaterial world or not, for it is held that immaterial things or stuff exist. Since the mind is conceived of as immaterial, and what is immaterial is held to be real, then how does one distinguish between imaginings and reality? If your mind is immaterial, and immaterial is real, and the things that go on in your mind, even just imaginings, how do you distinguish between reality and that? What justification would there be for not holding everything we conceive of as being true? Here is the truth. Immateriality is non-existence. In fact, we cannot even conceive of the thought. All we can do is try not to think, try to not to think of anything. This encapsulates the essence of this article and this study. How does immaterialism affect one's thinking? Ellen White was correct. To believe in the immaterial virtually destroys God, for it makes him nothing. More than that, it destroys any and all justification and ability to discern between what is real and what is not, what is true and what is lie. Materialism is the foundation of truth. To destroy it is to destroy all. The assertion that the immaterial is real is the assertion that the non-existent 
exists in the very idea of it. It is by itself the declaration of that which is not true as being true and is therefore the idea of a lie itself. It is the lie which was introduced by the arch deceiver. It was the lie which led the antediluvian world astray. It was the lie that established Babylon and controlled Pharaoh and held up the religions of the Canaanites, the Assyrians, the Chaldeans, the Greeks. It was the lie which took the form of Plato's transcendentalism and which came into Judaism via Hellenization and corrupted the true faith of the Messiah in the form of what we call today Christianity. The lie is responsible for the Dark Ages and for every other wicked catastrophe which has reared its ugly head to demolish all that is good, whole, and pure. The lie is what led astray Jones, Wagner, and Kellogg. The lie is what has polluted the sanctuary, destroyed the priesthood, and so long delayed the building of the spiritual house. You have recently been called into priesthood and to build the temple of Yahweh. If you have not been filled with zeal for the truth and exchanged your thoughts for the thoughts of our Heavenly Family, know that the lie has a hold on you. How shall reason enter? How shall truth and love have the day? Branches, exercise your will. Stretch your mind to comprehend the truth. Receive correction. Let your mind be molded according to the divine similitude. Here is materialism. The truth is the truth. If materialism is true, there is only one fundamental reality. What is fundamental to reality cannot be destroyed, for to, just, to destroy it would be to destroy reality itself. The indestructibility of matter is proof that it is the foundation. What does this mean? It means that things simply are what they are. If a circle is a circle, it is simply a circle, not a square. This is what some know as the law of non-contradiction. It simply means that two contradictory claims cannot be true at the same time in the same sense. A thing cannot be a certain way and yet not that same certain way. No one truth can conflict with itself or with any other truth. There is only reality. There may be contrary claims to that reality, but reality is consistent within itself. This is the foundation of all logic and reason. With immaterialism, there is no reason for reason and no grounds for sense. For instance, if you say you believe the branch message, and the branch message teaches you that to believe it is to take Christ's words John 6, verse 35 and 63, and to abide in Him, John 15, verses 5 to 7, and that in Him is no sin, 1 John 3, 5, and yet you sin, then can it really be true that you believe it? Both cannot be true, can they? If that is where you find yourself, then let it be evidence to you that your mind is still running in the way of immaterialism. Many who have heard the truth of materialism as put forth in this message have seen it to be true and acknowledged that it is such or have acknowledged it as such. Yet few have evidenced the workings of the truth of materialism upon their way of thinking. The truth needs to be settled into, both intellectually and spiritually. What does it mean to settle into the truth? It means to actually let it be what it is. And for it to be 
what it is, is for it to stand without contradiction. For as we have learned, reality, truth, cannot have contradiction. Therefore, settling into the truth intimately involves the casting out of falsehood and every false way of thinking. It establishes reason upon the throne of the mind. One principle which materialism establishes in the mind is the right way of thinking about thinking itself. The right way of coming to conclusions as to what we believe and why. So, let's say that someone makes a claim about something. If that claim is true, it must be true in the material world. If we are to hold it to be true then, should we not require material evidence? Those of us who have been touched by immaterialism have formed the habit of coming to particular beliefs based off of something other than material evidence. Often we believe something because it supports or seems to support our other more foundational beliefs. Any evidence which seems to conflict with our foundational beliefs we tend to ignore give it little weight, or find a way to interpret it in some way which harmonizes with our beliefs, even if that interpretation is inconsistent with the facts or is a skewing of the idea itself. This mode of thinking is based in immaterialism, as it particularly makes our imaginations or our imaginings or beliefs to be esteemed as esteemed, or even more esteemed, in material reality. This way of reasoning will never lead one to truth. This matter of how we come to our beliefs touches on every aspect of life and is therefore vitally important to comprehend. We are told to be close, critical thinkers, Loma Linda Messages, page 428. Therefore, whatever the truth may be, it is that which we want to accept. And we want to accept it because it is truth. It is the truth which sanctifies or educates us. John 17, verse 17. And we must experience the truth ourselves, having it close and not at a distance, 1 John 1, verse 1. We must become intimately connected, intimately connected with and aware of reality. Therefore, we must obtain knowledge by observation and experimentation. Now I'm going to read a few quotes from Ellen White on this subject. The first is from Review and Herald, November 13, 1883, paragraph 13. Train and discipline the mind by study, by observation, by reflection. The next is from Gospel Herald, January 1, 1899, paragraph 5. As his, being God's, representatives and witnesses, we need to come to a full understanding of the saving truth which we must know by an experimental knowledge. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1, page 496, says, I saw that there is not one in twenty who knows what experimental religion is. And today I might add that that number is multiplied hundreds of times. There are very, very few in the world who know what experimental religion is. The next quote is from Review and Herald, July 20, 1897, paragraph 9. A correct knowledge of God is not a hearsay report, but an intelligent experimental 
knowledge. Next is Review and Herald, May 5, 1896, paragraph 1. We can be assured that we shall receive the Holy Spirit if we individually try the experiment of testing God's Word. Next is Signs of the Times, January 11, 1883, paragraph 24. The first two sentences are extremely important. I want to ask that each person pays close attention to them, as well as that which follows. Experience is knowledge derived from experiment. What we need is experimental religion. How shall we know for ourselves God's goodness and His love? The psalmist tells us, not hear and know, read and know, or believe and know, but taste and see that the Lord is good. Instead of relying upon the word of another, taste for yourself. This next statement is from Christian Temperance and Bible Hygiene, page 109. And this statement is important enough that I would even go as far as um, recommending that each person here reads this statement multiple times and perhaps even commit it to memory. Again, Christian Temperance, Bible Hygiene, page 109. Experience is said to be the best teacher. Genuine experience is indeed superior to mere theoretical knowledge, but many have an erroneous idea as to what constitutes experience. Real experience is gained by a variety of careful experiments made with the mind free from prejudice, uncontrolled by previously established opinions and habits. The results are marked with careful solicitude and an anxious desire to learn, to improve, and to reform on every point that is not in harmony with physical and moral laws. That which many term experience is not experience at all. It has resulted from mere habit or from a course of indulgence thoughtlessly and often ignorantly followed. There has not been a fair trial by actual experiment and through investigation with a knowledge of the principles involved in the action. Experience, which is opposed to natural law, which is in conflict with the unchangeable principles of nature, is not to be relied upon. Superstition arising from a diseased imagination is often arrayed in opposition to reason and to scientific principles. To many a person, the idea that others may gainsay what he has learned by experience seems folly and even cruelty itself. But there are more errors received and held through false ideas of experience than from any other cause. There are many invalids today who will ever remain such because they cannot be convinced that their experience is not to be relied upon. And that's the end of the quote. Continuing. And again, this now isn't another quote from Ellen White, but just continuing in the article. Our so-called experience is not to be relied upon. Our past beliefs are not to be relied upon. Let us not try to confirm our biases. Let us not start with a conclusion and then endeavor to prove it true. Let us look at material reality and let it govern our beliefs. 
if we would know the truth, we must require empirical evidence. Since we all, since we all have been conditioned to think immaterially, we have all accepted beliefs which are not based in reality. These unfounded beliefs must be rooted out. In the messages of truth which our Heavenly Family has sent, they have sought to remove these errors, but we have been slow to learn. When heaven corrects an idea, a habit, or some cherished view, most are unwilling to part with their idols. Some are willing to give up certain points or certain positions. But other ideas, they are unwilling to be separated from. They give heaven permission to reprove them on points which are not of special interest or importance to them. But they hold other areas as untouchable, even by the hand, message, of God. And for those who aren't familiar, the reason why I say hand, message, is because throughout the scriptures, the hand is used as a symbol of a message. And if you see our studies on Revelation 10, you'll see that to be so. Now, there's another statement that I want to quote. This is from Spiritual Gifts, Volume 2, page 225. God leads his people on step by step. He brings them up to different points which are calculated to manifest what is in the heart. Some endure at one point but fall off at the next. At every advanced point, the heart is tested and tried a little closer. If the professed people of God find their hearts opposed to the straight work of God, it should convince them that they have a work to do to overcome or be spewed out of the mouth of the Lord. Said the angel, God will bring his work closer and closer to test them and prove every one of his people. Some are willing to receive one point, but when God brings them to another testing point, they shrink from it and stand back because they find it strikes directly at some cherished idol. Here, they have opportunity to see what is in their heart that shuts out Jesus. They prize something higher than the truth, and their hearts are not prepared to receive Jesus. Individuals, are tested and proved a length of time to see if they will sacrifice their idols and heed the counsel of the true witness. If they will not be purified through obeying the truth and overcome their selfishness, their pride and evil passions, the angels of God have the charge. They are joined to their idols. Let them alone and they pass on to their work, leaving them with their evil traits unsubdued to the control of evil angels. Those who come up to every point and stand every test and overcome, be the price what it may, have heeded the counsel of the true witness, and they will be fitted by the latter reign for translation. And that's the end of the quote. The principles we are speaking of need to be thoroughly understood, received, and experienced. Those who fail to do this will soon fall away from the truth. I know of no better way to communicate the light which our Heavenly Family has given me on this subject than to present examples of the employment of this immaterialistic way of thinking so as to manifest it in its true light. If we speak of these things in general terms and one fails to digest the truth, 
they will either not apply these principles in such a way to change their thinking, or they will only apply them selectively. What is required is a radical change in thinking. Since this immaterialistic thinking affects every area of life, we will be going through examples from a variety of fields of knowledge. But by no means are the examples and fields of knowledge we mention here the only ones affected. Our hope in going through these examples is that the general principle will be highlighted and that each of you can take these principles and apply them to all areas. Our purpose is not to dwell for long on any of these subjects or to make special advocation of any point in particular. Rather, our goal is to highlight the principle of how we come to conclusions as to what we believe. Now, what the rest of this article consists of, which we will probably be getting into tomorrow, um, is going through how immateriality or specifically immaterialism, the belief in immateriality, how that does a detrimental work to reasonable thinking. And we will be going through it on the subjects of health, physics, archaeology, history, politics, philosophy, and theology. Um, to give examples from each one to show how it's on every aspect of life that we are affected by this. And what I'm thinking we should potentially do is actually start into the first one of it, into health, to highlight the principles so that now, now that we've gone through what we're talking about and how immaterialism affects the mind and what immaterialism does to make us come to our conclusions by false basis and to show us how we've accepted things without a foundation and that we need evidence, empirical evidence for our beliefs. And so we've, we've given all of that, but now we want to give practical examples of how that applies. And so I think it, it'll be important for us to go through one of them tonight so we can see how what we've gone through so far practically applies. And then we can go through the rest tomorrow. So the first one is health. There are numerous contrary theories in the field of health. How shall we decide what to believe? Some have had bad experiences with mainstream medical doctors or treatments and so decide that mainstream medicine is bad. Others have political views that either demand or cohere with negative views of the medical field. Still others, because of religious or spiritual inclinations, take on a view of health which conforms to their metaphysical beliefs. Do any of these perspectives lead to truth? Now, I just want to pause here and mention for a second. All these subjects, remember what we just read from Ellen White, how she said that God takes us through step by step, brings us up from point to point, and some come up to one point and they pass the test. They receive the correction or the rebuke. But they come up to another, and because it strikes at some cherished idol, they're unwilling to give it up. And so for some people, this area of health is their cherished idol. And there will be theories held to and strong beliefs that people have concerning health-related issues that they will be unwilling to give up. And some will even reject or walk away from this message because of that unwillingness. Others, health isn't really their issue. They will receive the correction and the rebuke on health. 
but it may be some political view that they hold or some historical view or some view on some archaeological theory, whatever it may be. So what I want to, to say and to press home to each of you is to detach yourselves from emotional attachment to your uh, preconceived notions which you have as we come to these subjects. And a preconceived notion, it's, it's something we all have. It's just what you have held to up to now. Everyone here has preconceived notions. And we have to understand that we may very well be called to give these things up. And so we're going to go through health tonight. Some here, that may not strike a cherished idol. They may say, okay, I, I get that. That makes sense. Simple enough. I accept it. Others have had this as a cherished idol. And some who were part of this message have walked away from it as a result of what our Heavenly Family has revealed in terms of spiritualistic ideologies in the health field. And others have been severely tested by this revelation and have had an, a difficult experience with it, but yet have been willing to persevere with the truth and subsequently give up this idol. And some have done that. And so... Health is one of the things that we've covered in this message before, and we have videos on YouTube where we've gone through it before. But it'll be important to mention here because this isn't just to show, oh, well, here's some spiritualistic practices in alternative medicine, and we need to stay away from them. This is striking at the underlying principles of immaterialism as they work in the mind that causes people to accept those theories in the first place. And so the implications of this are far deeper and far further in their reach. So even those who have been listed on the point of health, I want to give you a message of comfort that our Heavenly Family is wanting to take you beyond even where you presently are into a way of thinking which is their way of thinking. It is the truth. It is material reality. So let us ever move onward and upward. So again, I'm just going to read this last part again. There are numerous contrary theories in the field of health. How shall we decide what to believe? Some have had bad experiences with mainstream medical doctors or treatments and so decide that mainstream medicine is bad. Think about the thought process and what is being described. That's the emphasis. What's going on in the mind of the person who's had bad experiences with mainstream medical doctors and treatments and so decide that mainstream medicine is bad. Others have political views that either demand or cohere with negative views of the medical field. Still others, because of religious or spiritual inclinations, take on a view of health which conforms to their metaphysical beliefs. Do any of these perspectives, any of these modes of thinking, lead to the truth? Truly, no. Why? None of these views address physical reality and come to conclusions about causal relations between various substances by means of critical examination of empirical data. So again, none of these views, none of these modes of thinking, none of these ways of coming to conclusions about our beliefs are based on physical reality. None of them come to conclusions about causal relationships between various substances by means of critical examination of empirical data. When we have a negative experience from a treatment or from a doctor, and then we make a conclusion about 
a field of knowledge, whether it's medical field or whatever it may be, based off of that, even if our conclusion is true, it's not the right mode of thinking. It's an immaterial perspective because it's not basing our conclusions on physical reality, but by our subjective experience. Most religious people, including Adventists, Davidians, and Branch Davidians, have adopted spiritual views of health because we have been led to believe that that is in harmony with our religion or our overall world view. Many have accepted unsubstantiated practices such as homeopathy, acupuncture, and so-called energy healing. These practices are rooted in immaterial ideas, as can be seen by an examination of their history and un underlying principles, and should therefore be wholly avoided. What is important in relation to this discussion, though, is to understand your own thought process as to why you used to, or still do, accept these theories. And I, I want to mention here, just in case there's anyone who is on the call, who listens to this study later, who currently believes in these methodologies such as homeopathy, acupuncture, or energy healing, and there's many, many more, that many of us who believe this message used to practice those methods and believe in those methods and can testify at the difficulty in coming to terms with the fact that those things are not true and that they are rooted in spiritualism or, in other words, immateriality. Um, so I just want to encourage you all that uh, to investigate these things upon their own merits. You're not required to believe that these things are spiritualistic because we say so. In fact, you are required not to believe it because we say so. You're required to believe the truth because it is the truth. What we really need is to carefully conduct experiments and reason from cause to effect. When we are unable to do this ourselves, we ought to conduct the best, or sorry, we ought to consult the best available information. Please consider the following statement from Victor Hoda which we exhort all who profess to believe in ins the inspiration of the Rod message to take very seriously. Now this statement is from a book that Victor Hodoff was working on when he died. He never had the opportunity to publish it uh, or to finish it in terms of um, really kind of, as, as you write something, you go through uh, editing and this and that. He never was able to finish all of that and actually publish it. But the manuscripts were still there, and so we have Entering Wedge Part 2, and Benjamin wrote and published it in the late 1960s. So this is the Entering Wedge Part 2, pages 15 to 17. And so we, this is a rebuke in some regard uh, that Hodaf was giving to Davidians and Adventists concerning um, incorrect views in relation to health. And so especially those who believe that Victor Hodaf was sent as a prophet of God should really take seriously the things that he says in this statement. Okay, so quoting. Now at the outset of our study, let us note that the testimonies to the church say on the subject, or let us know what the testimonies to the church say on the subject of health reform. Here are the statements. Our workers should use their knowledge of the laws of life and health. They should study from cause to effect. Read the best authors on these subjects and obey religiously what your reason tells you is truth. That's Councils on Health, page 566. And Victor Hodaf continues. And here are the conditions upon which they are made. 
The command to inquire from the best health authorities is a positive declaration to health seekers that Sister White's knowledge of food values and their effect upon the human machine did not originate with her and did not originate with heaven, but with the best health authorities in her day. Since we therefore take the part of her writings that originated with her as inspired, we are definitely charged by heaven itself to inquire from the best health authorities in our day, as she did in her day, if we care for our health. And whatever their findings be, that is what we must believe, and their recommendations we must accept and obey in preference to their recommendations of her day. For in her day, knowledge on the subject had just begun. And I want to point out as a side note that Victor Hoddaf here is speaking of how in the days of Ellen White, the knowledge of this subject, the subject to which he is referring in relation to knowledge of health, had just begun. So he's not referring to ancient practices that um, people today sometimes promote by saying, see, look, these things have been around for thousands of years. He's talking about something that the knowledge of which had just begun in her day. And he's saying that according to her own statement where she instructs us from heaven to read the best health authorities on these subjects is an admonishment to read the best health authorities in our day in preference to what best health authorities in her day said. Continuing with Victor Hoddaf's statement, Anything short of this, therefore, is direct violation against heaven's appeal as it is against the individual's health interest. The great question that now arises is not so much what she teaches on diet as it is to know who the best health authorities are and what they teach. Now this next part is so important. Victor Hoddeth asks the question, who are they? Who are the best health authorities? Certainly not those who label their products, writings, and professional practices health, nature, drugless, and so on. These are not health authorities at all and most of them are in the field to sell either their profession or their so-called health product. Then, too, these professionally shrewd studiously down all popular products and professions, for they well know that their only opportunity to sell something to the public depends on making people prejudice against, prejudice against and fearful of the products and professions of all others. They know that in no other way their so-called health and cure stand a chance at all. So, they spend years in studying how to frighten the public from the well-known markets and professional <coughs> things and how to, drive, how to drive them to their own so-called health shops and place, places of professional services. And as there are multitudes of people who are ever looking for something new and better, many thoughtlessly flock to these unapproved places where they in time discover that they have swallowed a quack's bait, sinker, hook, and line. At last, they find themselves hanging on a fish pole, as it were, with empty pockets and with inflamed stomachs. So that's the end of the quote from Victor Hoddeth as found in Entering Wedge Part 2, pages 15 to 17. Continuing on. Have those from whom you have received your health education labeled their products, writings, and professional practices health, 
nature, drugless, and so on? Have they downed the popular products and professions and well-known markets and professional places? If so, then you, along with so many of us, have been educated by pseudoscientific minds who are not true health authorities at all. Who are the true health authorities then? True authority lies not in position, in reputation, or in number of adherents. Rather, it lies solely in truth. And I reference everyone to a video that we have on the YouTube channel called WTC, or What is the Church for Church Authority. It's in the What is the Church playlist, the fourth video. Since truth, so notice, authority lies only in truth. Since truth is the material reality, then the true authorities must be those who present reality as it really is. The only way to know the nature and function of material reality is by material evidence. Therefore, whoever speaks the truth concerning the material reality of any given health issue and supports that truth with sound material evidence is a true health authority. This brings to view, perhaps more than ever before, the need for true scientific inquiry. From this point forward, when we hear claims, let us question and consider the evidence. For example, many speak out in opposition to vaccines. Most of us have just accepted the idea that vaccines are bad because of testimonies we have heard concerning bad experiences with vaccines. But as we have just learned, quote, that which many term experience is not experience at all. Real experience is gained by a variety of careful experiments made with the mind free from prejudice, uncontrolled by previously established opinions and habits. The results are marked with careful solicitude and an anxious desire to learn, to improve, and to reform on every point that is not in harmony with physical and moral laws. Experience is knowledge derived from experiment. Those are selections from the quotes that we read from Ellen White earlier. Should we not then investigate the hundreds of experiments which have been conducted by well-established evidence-based institutions concerning issues such as vaccines? It really comes down to whether we want to learn the material reality of the situation or if we prefer to believe the theory that we have acquired while having our minds overrun by spiritualism. <clears throat> and I want to point out on the issue of vaccines, I'm not advocating a position one way or the other on vaccines. What I'm advocating <clears throat> is for us to not just believe what we've always believed concerning vaccines, but to investigate according to material reality and to go and see because there have been hundreds of very rigorous scientifically based and evidence-based studies conducted on these subjects that should at least be investigated. And what should we fear? If something, if it was to turn out, for instance, just for instance, not that I'm advocating it, but if it was to turn out that vaccines are totally fine, why not accept it? What would be wrong with that position? If it's material reality, then it is true. And there's nothing wrong with that. And we should just accept it and be happy, you know? And it's, it's the idea of immaterialism that makes us want to cling to a theory and makes us want to not want the truth to be a certain way. If we find ourselves saying, oh, well, I don't want it to be the truth that uh, vaccines are valid, or, or whatever the case may be, just as an example, 
if we find ourselves thinking that way, then we need to recognize that that is a, a bias and a preconception that we have accepted into our way of thinking. And why is it? Well, perhaps because of different experiences that we've undergone, or perhaps because of different experiences that we've seen other people undergo, or perhaps because we've, we have a political view that necessitates that thinking, or because we have some other um, view or some other thing that is going on in our mind in relation to that issue, where it's an emotional point, whatever the case may be. But the fact is, hey, you know what? If vaccines are bad, for example, then the material evidence will bear it out. Just like how, you know, when I was studying the branch message, I decided, and I knew that I should, I decided that I would give the message that David Koresh had a fair hearing. And I, I knew that even if it was true that he had sexually abused young girls and that he was stockpiling weapons and all these different things, I knew that if those things were true, that that in itself would not necessitate him being a false prophet. But that if he is a false prophet, it will doubtless be borne out in his teachings. No false prophet is going to have true teachings other than the truths which he basically uh, stole or borrowed from the scriptures. But any of his unique points will not be true. No new truth is revealed through a false prophet. And so I went to investigate his message on its own merits. And that's an experiment. That's experimenting. That's experimental religion. And I concluded, based off of the empirical data of his message, the actual evidence of what he taught, that his teaching was not a thus saith the Lord, that it was not according to the law and to the testimony. You know? But it, it would have been wrong for me to have a, a bias in which I... I desired that his message would not be true and allowed that bias to dictate what I believe. No, what I believed had to be founded on facts. Just so it is with all these things. So let us not fear investigation. Let us not fear questioning and testing our beliefs. Ellen White even says about the foundational face of Seventh-day Adventism, she says that if our teachings are not sound, the sooner we know it, the better. That's how we need to approach all these things. That is how materialism changes our way of thinking. And we have many more areas that we're going to be going through tomorrow that address this way of thinking even more so and even more thoroughly and giving different examples from different areas different fields of knowledge. And yes, doubtless there will be things that you have held to that may be stricken. But don't allow that to prejudice you. Be willing to face the truth for whatever it is and allow our Heavenly Family to comfort you in that. Because after all, you know, being uh, either upset or whatever the case may be over all these things really isn't going to bring anyone anywhere. So, anyways, um, we will continue on some of these subjects tomorrow, but that's the end of what we're going to go through tonight. Are there any thoughts or comments on the subject? I think you sort of got everybody sort of in deep thought. (laughs) 
Well, praise our Heavenly Family. So it was sort of serious but funny and a smile and going, what is anybody supposed to say right now, really? Um, just, just a lot of things. And yeah. that's fine. You know, that's, that's fine. I mean, our, it's okay, and it, sometimes it's better, especially if anyone here finds themselves um, aggravated by anything that was said, perhaps it's better not to comment yet, but to hold back and just talk to our Heavenly Family about it. Just it's talk not, to them about it. It's not so much aggravated. Nobody's, I, I don't think anybody's aggravated. I, I like, I think what it is is just really thinking about it and go, man, this is what I have been doing. This is, you know, it's not an issue of aggravation. I don't think anybody is aggravated. I think it just really, you start to contemplate. You start really looking at everything, decisions that you've been making, uh, you know, aspect of the health issues about certain things that we held for the longest time. Why reason? You know, you just—it's just so much stuff that you're literally almost taking your whole life, running through your life right now, and attaching the point in which was made, and being honest and saying, "Wow!" So that sort of puts you in this like quiet mode, and that's why I'm saying I don't. I think that's where. Probably everybody is right now, and I would have been that way if I had never said something. So to sort of let you realize that or let you know that we're not just because we don't want to say anything. I think we're just all really doing a lot of self-application, at least from now. Yeah, and there's things that have to change. I mean, just the mindset cannot walk away and not change right now just really in how one starts really evaluating the decisions that they've been making in their lives. So that's sort of believe. Nobody is aggravated. If anything, it's great that we're agitated, you right. know, but we're not ag- aggravated. I'd like to give a personal testimony briefly. When these truths started coming out, a little over a year ago, um, you know, those of you who have been on during the past year have heard me say this before, it really struck home to me. It was a personal issue for me because I'd been a licensed massage therapist for 16 plus years and was very much into the, quote, alternative health field. And... So one of the main areas of learning about immateriality that were affected in my life and my thinking was in the health field. But over the year and and plus since then, as I've been learning more and more in this message, and our Heavenly Family has been revealing more and more Let's take the political aspect, too. I'm not going to go into details on that, but I'm just saying that that's another area that they brought me to. And what's happening in my life is, you know, we're told that we're to raise from glory to glory. And we're also told that even our heavenly family continually advances. I forget where Ellen White says that, but it'll be addressed, I'm sure, sometime very soon. Um, sanctification is the work of an ever lasting lifetime and so we're to continually advance and I see that happening by learning these principles and you know it happens frequently that I'm brought to a point that I did not realize was there in my thinking that I, you know, our Heavenly Family makes me aware that that is not their way of looking at things or approaching investigation or whatever the case may be, fill in the blank. And it has been such a blessing to be learning mm-hmm. the proper way of investigation 
so that when I am made aware of something that I have taken for granted as being one way, and it's just like not even conceived of in my mind that it could be any other way, and that I'm shown that it could be another way. It's wonderful. I praise our Heavenly Family because what's happening is our minds are being freed from the deceptions of the devil. We're being freed to be able to see truth and reality and to be armed with the scriptures and the writings of all the prophets, not just those that are in our biblical canon, to, um, to be armed with the knowledge that has been delivered to us over the millennia so that we can use a thus saith the Lord or it is written to counteract any deception. Amen. Amen. I have a comment. Please. Well, and I think many of you know my story in regard to the natural healing thing. Um, it's certainly been an idol in my life. But um, but I've just been thinking about how, you know, our Heavenly Family is really trying to grow us up into thinking like intelligent adults. Because you know, what you've been teaching us and what we've been, uh, what you've been teaching is, is really the way people become sheeple, <laughs> you know, and it's really a lazy way of thinking, you know, like, like you mentioned, well, you know, I believe this way and people that believe this way also believe this way about that, you know, and that's just an easy way to really not think at all, but just to, um, you know, think, well, just, yeah, to think, but to think stereotypically and make make connections and, you know, um, that type of thing. But anyway, they're wanting to teach us to be, to, to think analytically and critically and be intelligent like they are. Yeah. Amen. Totally. Yeah, it's a radical change in thinking. A very radical change in thinking. But um, it's it's important radical change of thinking to undergo. Vitally important, in fact. And uh, it is all for our benefit that our Heavenly Family is showing us how to think in terms of reality. It's really for our benefit. Amen. Some of us might have to admit we've been wrong. Yeah. Yeah. But that's that's certainly preferable to keeping on being wrong. Mm Mm-hmm. Hey, um, Meg, did you have a question? Yeah, I did. Sorry. I don't have a very good connection where I'm at. Um, I, I got bumped off. Um, yeah, I had a question because it just dawned on me what you're talking about the homeopathy and then bringing up the vaccines, and I had never thought about it this, that way. But aren't vaccines a form of homeopathy, only in the negative aspect of it? Instead of instilling a little bit of, of, of something that might be beneficial to you, they're putting a little bit of something that is detrimental, a disease into you, um, in the hopes that it would protect you. But that was just a thought that came to me. But I just want to say as present truth believers that nothing should be offensive to us at this point in, in moving forward and upward, as you were talking about. And um, I... I I don't think anybody on the call would, would be offended or agitated by by something that was said. Yeah. Um, that's, that's me. Well, that's good. Um, and actually, I'll, the question that you're asking about homeopathy and vaccines is actually a really good one. I'll mention something briefly on it, although 
more than anything, I just encourage uh, individual ex uh, experimentation and investigation on the subjects. But one of the, the key differences, homeopathy is based on a couple key principles. Uh, one is the principle of uh, similitudes or like heals like, which basically states that something that causes uh, a similar symptom to your disease will heal it. So if someone has burning eyes and then there's some sort of pepper or some sort of herb or whatever that causes your eyes to burn, that that will be uh, taken as a, a, a sign that it heals your irritated eyes. That's just an example. It goes, there's so many things beyond that in homeopathy. But then the, the next principle of homeopathy is the principle of repetitive and um, extensive dilution, even to the point where literally uh, homeopathic, uh, homeopathic medicine is diluted to the point that there is not even one molecule left often of the so-called active ingredient. And the way, and this has been tested in labs where they have taken different homeopathic uh, homeopathic pills or other forms of homeopathic uh, medicines and tested them in a lab and have literally been able to, in different substances that are prescribed for different things, find no active ingredient in any of them and that they were all the same, basically sugar pills. And the way that uh, homeopaths say that they are still effective is by saying that it's not really the substance itself that heals you, it is the frequency of the subject that is retained in the pill and that the frequency is just something that's immeasurable. Or the liquid. Yeah, or the liquid. And it's that frequency or that uh, liquid is the idea of an immaterial frequency or liquid, kind of the same type of thing that Mesmer promoted in his theory of animal magnetism. So in homeopathy, there is no actual physical substance happening, and there's been hundreds of times where thousands of people have downed full bottles of homeop homeopathic pills <laughs> in public just to prove that there's nothing in it. There's actually... a it, this happens annually. There's a movement trying to show how there's nothing there. Mm -hmm. um, so that's homeopathy, whereas vaccines, there's actually um, small amounts of certain... Uh, whatever you know, molecule or, or bacteria or virus or whatever they're introducing to your body, in small enough amounts that your body's immune system actually responds and produces antibodies. It's just so very different from homeopathy. Um, yeah, I'm not familiar, that familiar with homeopathy, but I just want to, you know, I, I did hear the principle, and I don't know, I'm not, you know, so I can't really talk intelligently on homeopathy, but I knew, I knew it was small amounts of things that were put into it. That's all I knew about it. But, you know, I, I have heard the principle in natural remedies that it, once something is introduced into your body, vitamins, minerals, whatever um, substance, that the particles are too large to actually enter your cells. And when they pass by, and I've heard of that, it's the picture of the item rather than the substance itself that enters, that passes by and heals. And so I was like, what, what is, you know, at the first I was like, okay. And then I, I, tried to, I tried to apply everything to the Word of God, okay, and I tried to find a type. And so I was, it was like um, in the wilderness when they were, the Israelites were, attacked by the serpent and you know to be healed all they had to do was look and live right and Ellen White says that some were so sick that they couldn't even lift their heads to look at the serpent on the brass pole and so their 
loved ones had to lift up their heads so that they could see it, and then they were miraculously healed. And I thought that was interesting because it was a picture. What was the principle behind it was what is killing you, if you look at a picture of that, it, it miraculously heals you. What a concept, you know? And it's like, how do we, you know, take a hold of that in relation to um, material and immaterial? Because the brass circuit on the pole was just a picture of what was killing them. And, you know, the simplicity of it was look and live. And some didn't believe it, and so they didn't look, and they died. I mean, it's just so far from us, I think, wrapping our minds around that, that that happenstance, that actual event among God's people. And then, you know, Jesus said, if I be lifted up, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, you know, I will draw all men unto me. And so it's um, a picture of Christ. And then you have the serpent on the pole in medicine. That's their symbol. And um, so it's quite interesting. It's also yeah, a picture of our dollar sign. Right. Serpent on two poles. Well, on, the, on the issue of the idea that um, when we eat the different vitamins and so on, cannot actually enter into the cells. The thing is that that's actually what minerals are for, which is why it's so impo- important to eat real salts, because minerals actually make us able to take the different elements from vitamins and bring them into the cell. There's not some uh, energetic or frequency thing or vibrational thing that's going on there. It's actually just a biochemical. Um, and one thing you want to mention is how it's um, basically the important thing when we have a question, the first thing to address is, well, what is it, how do we discern the truth of it on its own merits? So we take the initial question of, okay, well, is it true that vitamins cannot enter within the cells? And how does that work within the bodies? How do our cells benefit from vitamins? And then we ask that question, And first of all, uh, seek the answer uh, from where the question specifically pertains. So we have the issue of this, and it's a specific issue about ourselves. So we look at the cells, the book of nature, you know. And something else that's a special circumstance isn't necessarily telling us um, the rule for, you know, how we should view one particular thing that's unrelated. Um, With the brazen serpent, though, I know Ellen White does say in uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 430, that there was no power in the serpent to heal them, and no power in in looking on it that healed them. It was the act of faith. And as to how these different healings happen, how the miracles, how turning water into wine happen, we know that these things are physically possible certain of these things have like people have done certain of these things in labs and so on so it's physically possible although we don't know exactly how all that works nor do we need to know but when we see amazing things that happen you know Ellen White in one of the statements that we read she said an experience which violates the unchanging rules of nature is not to be depended upon. And so when we see things and we can test it by the rules of nature, then we have an opportunity to discern whether it's true or not. Whereas um, the miracles that Christ wrought, for example, we don't have the opportunity to um, you know, test those or anything like that. We, we don't really have available to us to discern those things from a distance like this. Um, Other than what we do have as empirical data is 
the testimony of Scripture, which is actually empirical data. These manuscripts go back thousands of years, and we can actually see, hey, here is an actual document of the book, The Wisdom of Solomon, or the book of Daniel, or this or that, and it says such and such a thing will take place, and it did take place, and that's just unavoidable history, and so it becomes empirical data on the historicity of Christ. So, you know, like I said, don't know how all these different miracles happen, but I definitely <laughs> use a miracle to to justify something like homeopathy or or um, energy healing or something that's based off of an immaterial concept when the very uh, books that record these miracles thoroughly promote materialism. God works within his own science in a sense where as but the problem is that we don't know the advancements, or we don't know the extremities of science. I mean, if we look at even a hundred years ago mm-hmm. and what they understood in science um, and compare it today, you know, a hundred years ago, two hundred years ago, they would say there is no possible way this scientifically could happen. And and with all the advancement of science that they had at that time and the top scholars of science at that time, those things would have been virtually impossible, right? And then we look at science and technology today, and there are some things that we're saying that's virtually impossible, and yet, you know, are we in the same realm of those people two, three, four, five hundred, a thousand years ago that didn't think it was impossible? Possible. So. Science in itself, or um, the possibilities within science in itself, right? If God worked outside of his, um, his own science, then it would make it immaterial, per se. In another word, um, he, would, he would be working within something that is not true. He would have to be working within something that is true, in that process of healing the people, because if the serpents who bit them were actually poisonous serpents, which they were, um, then by the law of nature and science, they should die. So the only way to heal them is going to be by the law of nature and science. Because we, don't, we can't understand it in itself, it just seems so vast, but I guess if we put ourselves in the position of people a thousand years ago, right, in how it's going on today, that we may see that, you know what, yeah, you know, are we at that point right now where a thousand years from now we will know how that happened, and I'm pretty sure we probably will. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were finished. It's just, I, it's just one more quick thing. Sister White, when she was given a vision of heaven, she said there were colors there that has no explanation, no description of. So how many millions of colors, you know, back in the days we only knew of the the, the four main colors, right, Um, that we use in our system, and yet there are colors outside of those four colors. Now, those four colors make up millions of colors. Okay, whether it's uh, blue, yellow, uh, magenta, um, and, and, you know, and uh, what else is, um, chi- is chi- cyan, uh, magenta, um, yellow, and, and black, or whatever. And from those, it's all millions of colors are made. Now imagine that there are colors that don't even fall in those four categories, and you can't really describe them because you don't know, they, they don't exist in your world. But they do exist. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So yeah, that's outside of that's our scientific true. mind. So we can't imagine something that don't exist, but it doesn't mean that it does not exist. All just right? Just seen it. Right. And I, I just want to point out on frequencies because, you know, I, I mean, frequencies are real. So, I, you know, I mean, and, and Ellen White says that 99% of healing is is uh, mind our mind cure, and 
and that leaves 1% to uh, natural remedies. And so, you know, it's, you know, since we're talking about materialism versus immaterialism, well, so what about the Daniel 2, the vision of Daniel 2, that dream? You know, so that's, you know, not material, but is it real? Well, it well, really happened it. to Nebuchadnezzar, but it's not a material thing. And, you know, and, and yet, you know, he put it into a material thing, and he brought out a truth. And that is, as a man thinketh, so is he. So when he created the image of gold, all of gold, he was perpetuating that truth. Well, if my head's gold, then the rest of my body should be gold too, right? Because he's thinking that way. So, you know, it's like, you know, you deal with the dreams and visions and, yeah, and, and they're symbolic. And so Daniel said, well, you know, God didn't give me your dream and tell me what it was for us, but he told me the dream for those who are there at the end of time, for them to understand it. So I thought that was really interesting that, you know, it's not really real for them, but it was meant for us at the end of time. And so, you know, it's like, you know, and God having Abraham leave Babylon so that he could come to this city that wasn't even on this earth at the time. You know, and he was searching for that city. And why would he lead him on a wild goose chase? Because he knew it didn't exist yet. And yet he knew by faith it existed just because God said so. And, you know, <laughs> I mean, how, how hard would it be to just pack up everything and just head out to who knows where? So, you know, it's, it's an interesting concept uh, concept of materialism versus immaterialism, but, you know, that's why we have the definition of faith, the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen. So based on the word of God, we have a preponderance of, an e- of the evidence that that city does exist and that the kingdom does exist, and yet we haven't seen it yet. But... He says that it's within us. And we still don't understand that we're there. So, it's, uh, just, um, Hey, Meg? Yeah. Yeah, I just want to ask, um, you know, this whole issue of materialism and immaterialism is so vast and broad and far-reaching. Yeah. It affects every subject. And, and to all of us, it has been a real retraining so I just want to ask you know as you continue to investigate the topic um, you know to just kind of be willing to uh, learn to view things from a different perspective than you perhaps ever have and how you know there's a lot you know even okay well you know we talk about frequencies well what is a frequency and then we learn well frequency is just that rate at which a particle vibrates and it's a real physical particle and the way that our mind affects our body is actually in a very physical way but it's not in a supernatural way or things like dreams and visions how they're not immaterial they're just conceptual which is actually very physical processes of the very physical brain you know I'm just mentioning some of these things as examples but it's just to say that there's a lot on this topic and that um, there may be things that you yourself may have to um, unlearn or relearn or learn afresh in relation to materialism and immaterialism. So it's the whole thing, it's a very, um, as we said, it, it relates to every topic. And I know it's a very hard pill for most to swallow. Um, but all things to the law and to the testimony, right? Right. Sure. Remember, um, 
you know, being an organic grower, remember when we uh, up here, we would put the um, the music in regards to our plants and the classical music and right. and um, and so forth and how we saw, you know, the section where our speakers were that the plants were actually much larger in its size and the fruits were much larger or the plants grew much quicker. And, you know, people could look at that in the per se as something quackery or don't understand. And you said um, sound waves in itself um, are actual particles dependent on how they move based on uh, the sound in which they push, whether it comes through very harsh and fast or whether they come through smoothly and so forth. And, and yet we've known after investigating it scientifically that, you know, we see that the birds at certain time of the day, um, certain times at dawn, an hour before dawn, is when you hear the birds the most. And the reason why all these things happen um, in triggering the plant, right, through vibration to open its pores up so that when the sun, the, the earth starts heating up, the, um, the CO2 that is rising is absorbed by the plant and that's what makes the plants grow much more vigorously. Now, that's something over years that we never even understood at the very beginning, but we practiced because we heard about it. But as we studied it out, we started understanding it. As we started, even myself, just getting up in the morning and hearing the birds at certain times, start putting it all together and figuring it out that it was God's way of actually... Oh, she, my goal got dropped off. That's too bad. But, yeah, I mean, all those things, you know, the vibration of particles opening pores of plants and different things like that, it's all a very physical process. It's just that today all these terms such as frequency, energy, vibration, people with immaterialistic thoughts have taken these and tried to make them something other than real physical particles and atoms. And they want to use the argument that because we can't see sound waves without special equipment, you know, there's sound waves that you can't see, you can't see wind, you can't, you know, there's certain things that you can't see, but we know that they're real. That, that's not to be applied to something that isn't real. Mm -hmm. It either has particles and is physical or not. Even though it's really small, mm -hmm. you can still, we have, we have the ability to see really, really tiny particles, like indescribably small, mm -hmm. but yet in the field of, you know, natural healing and all that, and, you know, once again, pointing fingers at myself, that's just something that we blindly accept as real because it sounds good. I, I guess I got kicked off, but it's okay now. <laughs> okay. My wife is laughing here going, you've been talking, you don't even know that you got kicked off, okay? Oh, that's funny. She goes, you missed a great speech. <laughs> yeah. We heard most of it. Yeah, most of it we heard, but you, the last thing that you said basically was about how, you know, over the years studying those things and experimenting and yeah. going out and hearing the birds and how, you found that, hey, that's actually God's way of having, you know, nature work in harmony with itself and so on, and, you know, the birds opening up the pores for the plants and all that. Yeah, and uh, it was just a, it's a physical aspect of things. Like, you know, there was no, no spiritual to it. It was a tangible physical in every aspect. Sound waves were physical. The vibrations were physical because they're actually the only way you can make vibration is by having particles hit each other. The plants were vibrating and opened up as everything became a physical thing. The very act of it being real and working and producing in itself had to show that there had to be a physical characteristic of our connection from the, the birds to the actual plant there had to be a constant physical connection in order for it to have any ties whatsoever, and it just didn't just happen by chance. Is Amen. What to do. 
I found a reference yeah. in the Spirit of Prophecy that speaks to what we've been talking about for the last little while, about um, the way, for instance, uh, um, Moses, uh, when they were at the bitter waters of Mara. Um, I, I work in the water treatment industry, so I know what's involved with the purification of water, but this this speaks to more than just physical. It speaks to spiritual. It's in the Ministry of Healing, 248, paragraph 1. It says, For every trial, God has provided help. When Israel in the desert came to the bitter waters of Marah, Moses cried unto the Lord, The Lord did not provide some new remedy. He called attention to that which was at hand, a shrub, which he had created, was to be cast into the fountain to make the water pure and sweet. When this was done, the people drank of the water and were refreshed. In every trial, if we seek him, Christ will give us help. Our eyes will be open to discern the healing promises recorded in his word. The Holy Spirit will teach us how to appropriate every blessing that will be an antidote to grief. For every bitter draft that is placed to our lips, we shall find a branch of healing. Amen. You know, one one thing that I want to mention on that, uh, when you introduced the quote, you mentioned how it's not just physical, it's spiritual. And I just wanted to address something in terms of uh, those terms and what that means. And it's very, very common to kind of contrast the physical with the spiritual. And it's but, kind of based off of... But they're one and the same. <laughs> exactly, right? It's, it's the, in reality, what, you know, today people think that spiritual means non-physical. Amen. But that's actually not what it means. The word spirit, both in its Greek origin as used in the New Testament and in its Hebrew origin as used in the Old Testament, it means that which is living or that which is breathing. And... So when we, when we talk about spiritual matters, we're talking about things that relate to everlasting life, and we're talking about things that relate to the breath of God, <clears throat> and that has nothing to do with something non-physical. Um, so, and then the other thing that's a point of confusion to some extent that will be addressed in this next issue of the Silver Trumpet is people misunderstand the distinctions between metaphorical and allegorical and, and uh, symbolic on one hand, versus, and they equate that with spiritual and non-physical, and then on the other hand, they have uh, literal and physical, when really every reality to which we refer is physical reality. The, the words that we use to describe that, that reality can be either literal or symbolic or figurative or metaphorical or allegorical or whatever. So... When Ellen White was talking about Moses in that statement, she was referring to a physical reality, describing it in literal terms. And then she used that as an allegory to refer to another physical reality, which she, as, which she is presenting to us as a possible experience through which we can go. And then she explained that physical reality with figurative terms. Just like, you know, you read Daniel chapter 2 and he's talking about this image and he's talking about literal events you know actual physical events and physical empires and so on and so forth but the language that he used to describe that was figurative but figurative and metaphorical and allegorical in no way equates to immaterial it's just simply that it's des describing material things using figurative or metaphorical language and often in fact spiritualism is based on a an over literal interpretation of the bible for example um in revelation chapter 6 when it's talking about the seven seals and the souls crying underneath the altar well when people read that and apply that in a very literal way, then you have the living dead. You have the 
conscious um, existence of the minds or spirits of dead people. And you take Christ's parable to be literal. You take the blood crying out, you know, the blood of Abel crying out, literal. You know, many passages of Scripture, if you take God being in you in a literal way, you take any of these things literal, which are not intended to be literal, but metaphorical, then you end up with spiritualism. So understanding true figurative language and metaphorical language in Scripture is actually a safeguard against spiritualism. So I I just figured it's, it's an important clarification to make because sometimes we, you know, by viewing those things... Uh, without really an understanding of how language is used as it relates to reality, it can kind of be, you know, we can kind of draw wrong conclusions in terms of the material and the immaterial. So we need to move into a place where we realize that our spiritual needs are indeed our physical needs. Yes. And even that, though, I, I'll just, I'm going to qualify with Kellogg right. uh, and, and Wagner, because here's the thing. <clears throat> Wagner, at one point, he came to the point that he believed, like, so interconnected, um, well, okay, it was the misunderstanding of the spiritual need with the uh, metaphorical description of that spiritual need as is found in the scriptures and applying that as being same as the physical need. So uh, Kellogg came to a point where he believed that by bathing with water, you can wash away your sins and that by breathing air, you are taking in the Holy Spirit. These are things that Wagner and Kellogg believed. And that was, you know, they would be able to use terms like that, saying our spiritual needs are our physical needs, but in a spiritualistic way, in a way that misapplies that. So what, what we need to understand is when we talk about our spiritual needs, what that is referring to is our need to have a change in thinking. Because only by a change in thinking can we inherit everlasting life. Because our change in thinking is the mind of Christ or the way of thinking of Christ. And all of our thoughts are material (laughs) processes of our physical brain. It's Mm -hmm. actually, you know, electricity going on there. And so we have these thoughts and we have free will to be able to, to change our way of thinking. Some people, for some reason, think that uh, a physical brain does not have the ability to think, that we must have a non-physical mind or a non-physical spirit in order to have free will and thought. But then you could ask the question, what properties does an immaterial mind have that a physical brain doesn't that enables it to think thoughts and to have free will? And there's nothing because an immaterial mind or a spirit has no properties at all. And there's nothing in a physical brain that would at all imply that it doesn't have the properties to have free will and thoughts. So the thing is, we have the free will, just like we have the free will to move our arm, and that's a physical action, we have a free will to think in a different way, and that's a physical action. And so our spiritual needs consist in a need of change of thinking, and it's by that change of thinking that we are adopted into God's family. And then our physical needs are things like, you know, food, shelter, water, all of that. And where these things connect is by saying, you know, this is the point of the, really the health message, is that since our thinking is dependent upon the health of our brain, you know, our ability to think properly. We absolutely need to have our brains and the rest of our bodies as healthy as possible so that we can think clearly, digest the truth, and make good decisions. 
primarily the decision to give up sin and to accept Christ and his righteousness. So that's where our spiritual needs, understood in its right context, and our physical needs meet. So I, you know, I just wanted to expound more on that just because I think it's, it's really important to have a clear, concise understanding of these things because the misconceptions of these things can be detrimental. <laughs> Amen. So anyways, I, we've been on for quite a while. We should probably close off, even though I've been thoroughly enjoying the discussion and I'm so happy that all of you guys came on the call. Look forward to starting a book tomorrow. Yes. But, yes, um, a lot to contemplate. Yes, a lot to contemplate. And there's a lot more tomorrow, too, so let's pray for, to be prepared for that. Yes. And let's actually just thank our Heavenly Family for everything now before we close off. Heavenly Family, we want to thank you so much for being so patient and so kind and so merciful with us. We have all had our minds filled with private interpretation and misunderstanding of reality and really just wrong thinking. And I am so grateful for the fact that you are here to correct our thinking and to show us truth as it really is. So please, Heavenly Family, guide us in these things. I want to ask that you send your angels to each one who is on the call tonight and urge it upon them to talk to you open and honest and to be willing to to truly forsake their ways for your ways and their thoughts for your thoughts. Heavenly Family, please help us as we seek you and as we seek truth. Help us to think right and to have our eyes singled to truth, to want to know it for what it is because it is truth and to accept it regardless of what the consequences may be and regardless of what idols we may have to give up. Heavenly Family, help us. And thank you for doing so. Thank you for loving us. And thank you for seeing the Son to have victory in fallen human flesh. Thank you so much. In the name of your Son, Branch, and in the name of your daughter, Amen. Amen. Amen.